welcome to Dialogue. Three months into 2023, some old foes have renounced their animosity and are mending ties, while others are still locked in a tense tug of war. With the China brokered peace deal that resumed the ties between Iran and Saudi Arabia, could we see a new order in the Middle East? Could the visits of multiple heads of state start peace talks between Russia and Ukraine? And will the competition between China and the United States further intensify? To help us answer these questions and more, I'm glad to sit down with Martin Jakes, author of When China Rules the World. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingduo. Welcome to Dialogue, Martin. You know, we are seeing this, um, you know, even, say, global economy. Uh, we have this banking crisis while well, the inflation remains high in the U.S. and uh, in the European countries. So in that you know, uh, respect, uh, if China's economy uh, grows at around 5% in 2023, what does it mean to the global economy? Well, if, if China grows, which I think it will, I mean, I, I think that that is a, a, a conservative figure. The growth. I, I would imagine the thought in the back of the mind is we, could, we might be able to do 6% or something like that. But never mind, 5% is good. Um, and I think that uh, uh, if China grows at 5%-ish, then that's certainly good news uh, for the global economy. But the outlook in, for the Western economies is, uh, I think, uh, a bit, the outlook is a bit cloudy because of the banking situation. Um, and we don't know how that's going to end. I mean, initially people, you know, a lot of Western commentators were saying, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, it won't be like 2008. Well, of course it won't be like 2008 because it's very unusual to exactly replicate a previous crisis. But uh, what is not factored into that kind of um, uh, wishful thinking is what are the consequences of bumping up interest rates with this speed after so long them being very, very low. I mean, they were artificially low to keep the Western economies uh, uh, going. And also they were, they were, in addition, a serious aggravator of inequality in Western societies. So that's another thing to take into account. Mm -hmm. Or in addition to this um, uncertainty in the economic prospects, also we have uh, the Ukraine crisis continue uh, to develop over there. And um, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping paid a visit to Russia. And beyond bilateral relationship, they talked about uh, a peace prospect you know, based on the Chinese 12-point uh, position paper. Some people would call it like a peace initiative uh, over there. Putin said, um, it's acceptable for Russia. Russia supports the idea, but it's up to the West. Um, and then we have the uh, leaders from European countries, for example, uh, French President Macron and uh, President of the EU Commission, Van der Leyen, are coming to China. Obviously, uh, people say the priority for them is to talk about the possible role uh, that could be played by China uh, in the Ukraine crisis. What do you make of it? Well, I think that there has been speculation about China playing a role in the West before. I mean, immediately after uh, the, the Russian action, um, there was uh, thought, it was, it, it was around a speculation that maybe China could play a role, but nothing came of it and, uh, uh, and, and it faded away. Um, and now it's come up again. Um, and I think that probably it's the, the, the credibility of such an idea is now at its height in this period. Uh, now, by saying it's at its height, I don't mean that this is likely to happen, but it is now a more serious thought than it was, it was before. Um, I think one of the most interesting reactions in this context was Zelensky's reaction. Because uh, we, one might have expected him to be very 
critical of the talks and so on. Well, obviously, he was very critical of Putin. But he very carefully did not criticize China. Uh, and I assume the thinking behind that was twofold. One, he knows that China could be very important to any ceasefire because if anyone is going to, in, uh, to persuade Putin uh, to have a ceasefire, China is easily the strongest candidate to be able to do that. And secondly, I think Zelensky's calculation is that when we have to, when, whenever reconstruction comes along, then China is going to be, or could be, very important. And of course, the two countries had uh, various economic agreements, uh, be, well, still in place, but before the war started. So I don't think it's, I don't think the idea is preposterous. Um, the difficulty is uh, the proximity of China to Russia, in the sense that it's not regarded as neutral, neutral in this situation. Uh, it's it, it's uh, it's a, a, at home tended to favour a, a, a Russian-style interpretation of the war and so on. So that that and that that is always brought up in the West. You know, well, well, really, they mean this or they mean that. But actually, I think in general, China's been tried very hard not to be interpreted like that. And I think it's managed to do that with some success. But interestingly, if you look at the U.S. response, right, even before uh, presidency arrived in Moscow, they say a ceasefire is not acceptable. What's their true stance? You know, why they are, you know, what's the peace plan from Washington or what's the plan from Washington for the crisis? Well, I think that um, actually America has been very opportunistic. Uh, in relationship to the to the situation, it's it saw uh, uh, Russia's action in Ukraine as a possibility, uh, offering a possibility for um, Amer American intervention and West becoming Western intervention and driving uh, the, the two closer together uh, and giving Russia a hard time, maybe even. Uh, although I think this is, all, this is uh, uh, always extremely unlikely, of getting rid of Putin, although that's what they always want to do. Uh, so I, I, think, I, I think that um, so far the war has been definitely in America's interests. Definitely. And America, you know, the truth of the matter is, despite Iraq and everything else, America does like intervening in, in these, you know, it's part of what they think they're about. So I, 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 I think that uh, uh, strategically the Americans will feel, you know, they've played a relatively good hand well during this. Now, there is one rider to that, and that is um, the war is not over, so the outcome is still unclear. And the global south, in other words, the countries that represent most of the world's population um, have taken more or less a similar position to China, you know, not joining sanctions, uh, 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 not supporting the American action. Sometimes they have, but they've not imposed sanctions and so on. So, so um, uh, what, what the war has done uh, to the Americans' disadvantage is to redraw or draw again the global map in a way where Europe and the West, Europe and the United States, are visibly a smaller part of the world than they were before. That this is seen as, in mainly regional terms, not in global terms, which is certainly the attitude of the global south. That is very important, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, previously we talked about the European leaders coming into China, you know, hoping China could play uh, some kind of a role in ending the crisis. Do you think the European views and the Americans are identical in terms of uh, what China can do? My guess is that Europe is a little bit more uh, inclined 
to think China might have a role and if it did have a role, that would be a good thing. I think that would be the, the thinking. And the reason that, that, would be, that, that for that is because the cost of this war has been great for Europe. The Americans, you know, I mean, it, it, the Americans are not involved apart from supplying armaments and so on. They're not, they're not, they're not uh, it's not on their doorstep, you know, oil and gas, they don't need it anymore in the way that they used to do, so on, so, whereas Europe's having to pay through the nose, you know, for a much higher gas and oil prices and so on. So Europe has been hurt by, uh, economically uh, by the war in a way that the United States has not. So they have a stronger interest in bringing this war to an end on terms that they can go along with than the United States. So there is a potential division there. Speak of uh, you know, the role of China uh, around the world, um, a recent case is the Saudi Arabia uh, agreement brokered by Beijing. You know, uh, Beijing has managed to bring the two rivals uh, to see eye to eye in terms of their future relationship or restoration of their diplomatic relationship. You know, many people have comments on that. Many people are looking forward to a new, like a rising uh, superpower, which acts differently from the U.S. Um, what's your opinion on that? Well, I think this is an extraordinary diplomatic coup, actually, by China, uh, because there was really relatively little anticipation of a breakthrough like this. Uh, I mean, you know, the Middle East has for long been thought of, you know, as the region where disputes ne are never resolved. They just go on and on and on. Um, and so suddenly, uh, you know, in a, a region where China has been active, but in no way has been particularly prominent or featured in any major way, suddenly brokers a deal between the two, in some ways, the two most important powers in the region, which have been at absolute loggerheads for so long. And, you know, that has the complications like the Yemen and, and uh, Lebanon and so on as well. So this was an extraordinary breakthrough, I think. And it's one in America's, historically speaking, backyard. It's not close to America, but America regarded it to be one of it, its most important regions. Um, and America, of course, could never have achieved anything like this. I mean, it, refu it regards Iran to be, you know, the sworn enemy and has done for a ever since Reagan and before. And Saudi Arabia, its relationship with Saudi Arabia, of, co of course, has been becoming a bit more distant than the, the intimacy that used to characterize that relationship. So this is an extraordinary achievement by China. And I think it sends a message to the world. Well, what message it sends? It sends a message that China really matters. It's got a capacity for influencing and uh, for uh, uh, shaping agreements in different parts of the world, not just in East Asia, but in the Middle East. Um, it's, it tells them that China has an interest in peace and conciliation, particularly in the developing world. So I think this is, this is a terrific uh, achievement by China, actually. Mm -hmm. Let's have a short break. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. Well, you know, basically everything around the world has something to do with uh, nowadays, you know, with the United States or China because they are the two largest economies and their relationship is also the focus for many world leaders in terms of the future. You know, we're talking about uncertain world, uh, uncertainty. Uh, one of the, I would say, uh, very controversial issue is about the Taiwan uh, issue. Uh, recently, we have um, uh, Honduras basically switched recognition from Taipei to Beijing. Uh, the latest case uh, of countries choosing to follow the one China principle and uh, having this is, uh, formal relationship with, 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 with Beijing. What does that mean, you know, to uh, U.S. has basically before that paid uh, a visit by a senior official to persuade that country to stick uh, to their relationship with Taipei, but they failed. 
Hmm. What does that mean to China-U.S. relationship? You know, of course, the Taiwan issue uh, in terms of a future, a future reunification, for example. Well, I, I think that each instance, like the Honduras, uh, uh, helps to um, isolate Taiwan uh, on the question of one China uh, policy. I don't think it's in itself strong enough to change the dynamics of the relationship between the US and China over Taiwan. I think this is a, you know, if, you look, if, you, if one thinks about it, um, the question, any deterioration, serious deterioration in the relationship between uh, China and the US was going to uh, damage the understanding on, on over Taiwan. It, it, it was the, the agreement that was most potentially um, uh, 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 open to uh, a shift of position by, in this case, the United States. So uh, uh, this is going to be, you know, I think this one's going to be uh, a long lasting problem that isn't resolved because uh, China's position is absolutely crystal clear. America sees it as, with the Amer mood in America now, you know, defend Taiwan. And, uh, and until there's an understanding between the two countries of a different kind, then the Taiwan situation is going to be a, a, a hot button issue. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we say Taiwan is a key, one of the key issues like uh, between China and the United States. Uh, you know, Washington has a one China policy, um, they say, uh, which is different from the one China principle. At the same time, they do maintain this, um, uh, this uh, relationship, this unofficial relationship with Taiwan. Um, previously, they called that kind of practice as a vague uh, you know, policy on Taiwan, but now, it's becoming more and more like clearer. They are, you know, not really abandoning one China, but they are supporting Taiwan uh, more publicly with um, uh, arms sale, uh, with a senior official visit like uh, Nancy Pelosi in Taiwan. Obviously, that will create some problem uh, between China and the United States. I can't see uh, the Taiwan situation improving uh, while the relationship between China and the United States is deteriorating all the time because that's the reality of the situation I think and uh, I don't see this being you know sorted out within uh, a short period because you know the genie is out of the bottle now and the genie is that America is worried, is feels threatened by the rise of China, and it cannot let go of the idea that it is number one in the world. It is its God-given right to be number world in the world, number one in the world. It is its DNA to be number one in the world, and we can see now very clearly how deeply held that position is. Now, of course, circumstances will conspire at some point or another to bring that to an end, to change it. That's not forever unless we're all blown up in a nuclear war, but that will not last forever. Circumstances will change. I think at some point, America will see the value of engagement as opposed to containment. I mean, the, in, the, the New York Times editorial board leader was a very important statement and strong statement against Biden's foreign policy, which is now a bipartisan foreign policy, saying containment is not in our interests, American interests, nor is it in China's interest and so on. You know, that would be, that, that statement is a basis for a different relationship. But that is still, uh, relatively speaking, in America, a voice in the wilderness, because both parties, you know, you could see how uh, the TikTok congressional hearing went, right. you know, which was kind of, you know, I mean, it was bear garden stuff, you know, I mean, it wasn't, 
it was completely undignified and disrespectful. Uh, an exercise in sort of subdued mass hysteria, you know. Uh, and I think that tells us a lot about the mood in America, yeah. to be honest with you. And, um, and I, don't, I just don't see that changing. So the main thing, being realistic, but not what I would like to be able to say, being realistic, the most that we can say on Taiwan, and it is important, is that somehow or other, there is an understanding between the two countries that makes sure there is no accident that goes badly wrong. You know, we don't want a, a sort of air balloon type situation in, you know, in the Taiwan Straits, because at the moment, it seems to me, the relationship is in relatively speaking free fall. That, I think that can be brought, I think that can be sorted out. I think there can be an understanding for, you know, between the two governments, etc., uh, to prevent that happening. In other words, to prevent, you know, uh, a Cuban missile crisis that goes fatally wrong, uh, which was the great credit of Kennedy and uh, Khrushchev didn't happen. Uh, so, so I think that's, Unfortunately, that's the most we can hope for. Well, you mentioned the containment. You know, some people could say the U.S. is launching a new Cold War against China, and uh, there's talk of like um, possible uh, new policies or bills. You know, basically preventing or investigating U.S. investment in China. Um, well, currently the relationship in terms of trade and uh, at least trade remains strong. Yeah. Um, but um, do you think the U.S. containment policy will succeed, uh, given the fact that China is the largest trading partner of more than like 130 economies around the world? The essence of the question is, how far can decoupling go? I think that's the big question. Um, and uh, I think it would be very, very difficult to decouple to a situation which resembled you know, the old last Cold War, when there was virtually no serious economic contact between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, I think that's, I think that's, that kind of um, ambition is for the birds, really. I mean, d you know, take Apple, for example, which is, you know, one of America's biggest companies. Um, and it's hugely invested in America. And, and, uh, and Tim Cook has spent a lot of time personally sorting out the supply lines and so on. Um, and it would be very difficult to unwind that uh, in the long run, let alone impossible in the short run, except in a, in a marginal way. Sure, you know, he can put some stuff in India, he can put some stuff in Vietnam, but we're talking on a huge, much bigger scale than that. So that would, that would be, you know, those kind of problems, that's just one obvious example. That's a kind of headline ver uh, example. But that's repeated in lots of ways through the American economy. So I think it would be difficult. But, um, you know, there will be a chip, chip, chipping away of the relationship, I think. Um, and pressure being put on um, companies. I mean, pressure's being put on Apple. Uh, yeah. uh, to, 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 to pull out. Um, it's, it's, it's a very depressing picture, you know, that, but it's that, that Biden has gone along the same route as Trump. Less bombastic, less showbiz, but in some ways, you know, worse. Worse. Trump. He's got a strategy and the strategy is containment. Trump had a plan for making life difficult for China, you know, tech, uh, trade war, tech war. Um, but, but this is a really, this is a, this is a carefully calculated strategic attempt to make life much more difficult for China. I don't believe it's going to succeed. I think it will fail. Um, it, it will fail in its own terms, for example, on, chi on the chip war. Yeah, it's going to make things very difficult for China. But do you seriously think that China's not going to be able to make chips 
given enough time? No, nonsense. Of course they're going to do, do it. Look at all the other things they've done. So they're certainly going to conquer the chip. So the idea that chipless China, you know, uh, chipless, chip, 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 um, chipless of um, anything with any fragment of American information in it is going to succeed in bringing China to its knees. Yeah, that's fantasy land. Then I'm thinking about the effects on the uh, international community you know, uh, in terms of the relationship between the two most powerful countries, in a sense. Uh, you know, we have globalization because we believe globalization uh, is the organic development based on the market principles and also the um, allocation or best allocation of resources. So you can pick up pieces from one country and produce in another country and then sell in the third country. Everybody benefits from this whole process. But now we are, some say, in the process of deglobalization or retreat of globalization. Everything is getting more expensive. Probably economy will slow. Every country will suffer actually from this process. Is that the case? Globalization, uh, the momentum in the broad sweep of things has come to an end and it's beginning to uh, be unravelling a bit. Um, we don't know how much. Um, it doesn't mean the end of globalisation. It just means the end of this era of globalisation, which has been based, for example, centrally on the relationship between the United States and China, not least economically. Um, but it's not the end of globalization, it'll continue. For example, China's certainly going to continue its own path of globalization. Um, uh, Belt and Road and all the other examples of that will ensure that. Anyway, China's a much bigger trading nation than the United States is, with a much larger number of trading partners. So I think that will, that will continue, um, but that will obviously be different from it being a global, a global phenomenon in the way that it has been. Well, thank you, Martin. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of today's discussion. Many thanks to Martin Jakes. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Tim Thanks for being with us. See you next time.